This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. This, this is a lively bunch. That is the loudest reaction I've ever gotten in recording one of these, and so I think it must be because of my guest, Mark Thornton, who is a senior fellow here at the Mises Institute. So we are here at Mises University. Let me just say as a commercial for those watching online, uh, I have a Lou Rockwell Hero t-shirt, and we encourage you to get those. Uh, they have quotes on the back. I'm not going to get up and turn around, but the top one, just to give context, especially for the students who don't know, is there was a, one time a New York Times reporter was doing a hit piece on Ron Paul, he came, he was in the Mises Institute, Lou Rockwell found out about it, hunted the guy down, escorted him off the property, and the guy said, well, I'm just doing a story. And he said, you, sir, are a mouthpiece for the regime. That really happened. He really did that. As Tom Woods said in a speech one time, he said, that's a boss move, right? Because some, some people might not know, oh, gee, what do we, we don't want to look like we're afraid. We'll answer their question. But no, Lou Rockwell just said, get out of here. So it was good stuff. Okay, so the topic, I, I promise you, I did not change topics Going into this, since Mark uh, has a lot of expertise on business cycles for, you know, thinking, what am I going to, what are we going to talk about? And I had said, you know what? I, for a while, have been talking about the inverted yield curve and how that's signaling a recession. Thus far, it looks like I'm chicken little. And I promise you, as of yesterday morning, I was thinking today, I was going to basically say to Mark, I know it looks like I'm crazy, but I still think the economy's in trouble. And then the markets, you know, freaked out yesterday. So now it looks like, <laughs> I told you, I knew I was right all along. So let me just, I guess, stop there and turn over you, let, get your thoughts. So in case you guys don't know, when we Austrians, again, we're not, um, we, we don't hang our hats on predictive ability, right? Well, like the, the Austrians are well known for saying in the social sciences, it's not like the natural sciences. You can't predict things with certainty. And in fact, that's why the methods of the natural sciences are inapplicable in the social sciences. Stop trying to be like the physicist, right? But at the same time, if we think that our understanding of like what causes the business cycle is largely correct, surely that gives us an edge compared to Keynesians who think that deficit spending is the way to help a depressed economy and so forth. And so when it comes to the housing bubble, uh, that you know, many of you may have been too young to really care about that, but in the mid 2000s, you know, there was a big boom and bust in housing. And when Austrians try to go around and grab quotes showing how many of us saw this coming, there's some great ones from Ron Paul in the early 2000s talking about how Fannie and Freddie and all these other measures, even under a Republican gov uh, president, to promote home ownership and so forth, were just you know gonna gonna end in in uh, sorrow. Mark, I think it was in 2004, had had a great article called Housing Too Good to Be True, I think was the title, and he just had some really prescient quotes just laying out exactly what ended up happening at a time when a lot of even free market economists were just like, oh yeah, U.S. economy is great, tax cuts for the win, and so forth. So just with that context, do you maybe want to just give some general thoughts about you know, how did you get into this area and maybe talk about your skyscraper index and so forth? Sure, Bob. It's great to be here. Um, the Human Action Podcast is my favorite podcast. It's the number one economics podcast in my mind, so it's great to be here today uh, and with a live audience. That's super great. Um, and also, I was actually there the day that the New York Times reporter showed up here at the Mises Institute down by the front door. Uh, I think Christie was at the front desk. And the, the New York Times guy comes in, so I'm a little intimidated there. And Lou just comes down and says, you're a mouthpiece for the regime. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe he said that. Um, the, the guy put it in his story, by the way, thinking probably like, oh, we'll show the people who these are. And then, of course, anyone who likes the Institute would read that. It's like, oh, this guy's awesome. So, yeah. <laughs> so awesome stuff does happen here. Uh, not every day, but... Uh, all, many, many times. And um, yeah, I, I, in college, I was interested in the business cycle. That's what got me interested really in economics because the times that I was in, in, in college were so bad in, in terms of the business cycle. And I didn't write about the business cycle in graduate school or for my dissertation. Um, but a few years ago, um, I started dabbling in business cycles and housing bubbles and things of that nature. And uh, in 2018, I published 
my book on skyscrapers in the business cycle, um, which you can all look at, by the way, um, on the website. You can look at a PDF copy for free or buy a copy down in the bookstore. Um, it's very accessible material um, written for everyone. Um, and so I encourage you to, to look at that stuff. And I think the business cycle is just fascinating, especially it's fascinating from an Austrian perspective because um, you can tell listening to the business media, the business press, economic experts, that they're all groping for an understanding and they know they're missing a big part of the puzzle. And, uh, and so Austrian economics doesn't tell you everything about a business cycle. It doesn't give you exact predictions about how much and when and that kind of thing. But man, you feel like you at least have a grasp um, on the topic. And, uh, and that's, that's the big advantage, I think, of this whole conference and, uh, and of your podcast is that we've, we start with trying to grapple with a theoretical perspective and a, and a theoretical perspective about a particular topic and then we start to look at the numbers and then we start to put it try to put it into context um, and then it's just a matter of if um, excuse me it's it's a matter of when uh, not if things are going to happen um, and so it's a big advantage uh, for everybody who takes the time to um, to investigate the Austrian business cycle theory uh, in the Austrian school in general. Yeah, and let me just elaborate on that point he made, Mark made there, that so the way this often plays out is, um, like, for example, one time on my personal blog, I had an offhand remark and I said something like, um, you know, as, as I have been warning for years, this I'm making this number. It was like, say I wrote this in 2015, I might be off a little bit, but it was the spirit of this is right. And I said something like, as I have been warning for years, the Fed's quantitative easing programs are setting us up for a crash. I said something like that. And so there were uh, co a colleague of mine grabbed that and, and talked about it over on the Econ Log website, which is very free market, but they're not necessarily Austrian. And his and he was kind of poking, you know, gently poking fun at me, saying, you know, along the lines of, "Well, yeah, if you're always saying the market's going to crash, eventually you're going to be right." And the fact that you're saying, "I have been warning for years," you know, the longer that gets, that doesn't mean, "Oh, I told you guys with so much advance warning." It means you weren't right. You know, so yeah, I understand. So I understand what he's talking about. And it's true, there is a tendency for sometimes people like on our side of this issue. Like once the government went off gold in the early 70s, some people are like, oh, yeah, the dollar's dead. The dollar's going to crash tomorrow. And they've just been saying that for, you know, 40 years. And at some point, you know, you could say, all right, well, maybe, you know, the, your forecast wasn't exactly accurate in that sense, right? Even though we all agree the de delinking the dollar to gold was a bad idea. So there, there is that element. But on the other hand, it's, it's very unfair to just dismiss a warning by saying you have to give us an exact timetable. Right, so like back when they were still using hydrogen in blimps, if somebody said, you know, this isn't going to end well, I think this is a bad idea, and someone said, okay, well, when's a disaster going to happen? And, and if you can't nail it down to the quarter, that doesn't mean you were wrong. And then when something blows up, you know, the Hindenburg or whatever, that you can say, I told you guys, and if they, it would be silly to say, well, no, you didn't tell us the exact week that that was going to happen. So really, you just got lucky. You were just a perma bear when it comes to you know that the blimp situation. That would be goofy, right? Or just in general, anytime someone's looking at a situation that you know, like if somebody cuts the brakes or something on a vehicle, and you're on the highway, and someone says, you know, the, the brakes on this vehicle don't work, and someone said, well, we're fine so far, you know, like that would be silly. Or to say, well, when is the problem going to happen? You say, well, I don't know. If, if, there's, if the traffic stops in front of us, we're kind of in trouble. Maybe you should take your foot off the gas and let us cook. And they say, well, no, we'll just keep going. And you can't tell me what, what stretch of the highway. Well, then that's silly. Tell me what exit you think there's going to be a problem. And then maybe I'll take you seriously. Otherwise, you know, you're just a broken clock that's right twice a day. You, you, you see what I'm saying? That that would be goofy. And so I think when it comes to Austrians warning that, yeah, the quantitative easing, that's not a good idea. That's setting the economy up. That's giving us a false sense of prosperity. It's going to lead to disaster. Part of the reason we can't say exactly when that's going to happen is that it depends what the rest of the investment class thinks, right? If everybody thought like the Austrians did, if everyone thought like Peter Schiff, 
as soon as the Fed announced QE, the dollar would have tanked and you know that would have been the end of the story, right? But the point is a lot of people have Keynesian views and they invest accordingly. So I'm saying that's part of the issue, but it doesn't mean you are wrong merely because you can't give an exact timetable of when this crash is going to happen. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that general topic? Um, no, I mean, I think you covered that. I, I actually do remember, though, now that you were talking, that I have a, a chapter in my book on skyscrapers where I defended you um, on the, a related topic, uh -huh. you know, where, of course, a lot of people listen to Bob. And Bob says a lot of things. And so it's easy to take him out of context. Um, and, and, you know, hold him to a, a, an unreasonable standard. But um, I show in, in this one particular case why it's actually very easy to defend Bob and for his position to be very legitimate and to represent a genuine concern. So um, I'm going to have this guy back on the podcast. Though. Yeah, like this and guy. it's actually great that people are attacking us. I mean, <laughs> yeah. or listening to us right. so carefully right. that we can't get away with every little thing we say. Um, so that's wonderful in some respects. So can you maybe just explain to students? You've, you've alluded to your skyscraper book. What about what actually your index was, and what you know why are you, you're referring to it as the skyscraper book? Sure. Um, you know, uh, over 20 years ago. Uh, I had been doing nothing but really microeconomics, and I read an article in the paper about the skyscraper index where by this real estate financial analyst was reporting the correlation between the construction of the world's tallest skyscraper and a subsequent world economic crisis. And it appeared, actually similar stories appeared in just about every business finance uh, publication at the time. And uh, everybody kind of made fun of it, made light of it, downplayed it. Uh, but I immediately saw a connection between this index, this correlation, and the Austrian business cycle theory. Because I recognized that in trying to construct something brand new that had never been done before, you're, you were going to need new technology, new capital goods in order to push the construction height higher and higher in terms of materials, elevators, construction uh, cranes, and, and all sorts of things. Even the materials themselves, the concrete, the steel, everything would have to change in order to reach those new heights. And so that's kind of what the Austrian business cycle theory rests on, is this stretching out of the stages of production and moving out further and further with advanced technologies. And that's an important um, phrase there, advanced technologies. Those are things that scientists are working on but business has yet to adopt. And so that's what was going on in the, the construction of these record-setting skyscrapers, and that's why there was a correlation between those records and then a subsequent economic crisis. It's because the periods leading up to that were periods of artificially low interest rates, where the major central banks in the 1920s, the 1960s, the 1990s, had all suppressed interest rates for a very long time, led to an exuberance and led to this investment in the far-reaching stages of production and the incorporation of advanced technology in capital goods to do brand new things. So in the 1920s, it was things like airplanes and radios. Um, in the 1960s, it was Polaroid cameras and transistor radios and cable TV. Um, and in the 1990s, you know, every age has its new thing. But record-setting sky skyscrapers was so, something, and in, in my subsequent research that I did in the book took the index from about a century 
back into the 19th century, and basically we saw the same thing. As soon as people started going beyond bricks and mortar, and they started using steel beam construction and elevators and that kind of thing, the skyscraper age was born, and so was the skyscraper curse because of these artificial interventions by the major central banks. And so the correlation holds up very well, and I think the skyscraper is something that illuminates what's going on in the typical business cycle, but it does it so over and over again. But it's not that the skyscraper itself causes the business cycle. It's just an illustration of what's going on all around the economy. So similar things about advanced technologies and building taller buildings are going on throughout the entire economy. So everybody's stretching out their, stru their structure of production in response to those artificially low interest rates. And so it's, it's a great in illustration. And if you're interested, particularly if you're interested in things like construction and real estate and technology of, that's all involved in that, uh, building materials, building features, building systems, um, it's all discussed in there for, from the layman's perspective. Yeah, and just to elaborate on it, so I'll, I'll be a little bit loose here just to you know, get the main ideas across. Um, you know, it, if you were going to go study the Austrian business cycle theory at the graduate level, it'd be a lot more rigorous. But just to give you the intuition, again, the idea is that the interest rate, in a sense, penalizes a business person for, for tying up resources for a longer period of time. Right, that yes, uh, the the consumers want entrepreneurs to take our available inputs, you know, labor and, and natural resources and uh, semi finished goods, transform them into goods and services available. You know, they want more goods and services or higher quality, other things equal, but they also want them sooner rather than later. So it makes a difference if a business enterprise is saying, "Oh, we're going to be able to give you a nice, uh, you know, a, a, a beautiful, gorgeous television that's much better than what you currently have." It matters a lot to say, okay, for the resources you need to produce that, are you going to have the TV available in six months or in six years? That makes a difference. And other things equal, the consumers want it sooner rather than later. And so, again, loosely speaking, the interest rate is kind of like the penalty that gets applied the longer you have to wait as a business person to sell the finished product to get you know the revenues to then be able to recoup your costs. Either in the sense of if you borrowed the funds – explicitly, you know, what you're paying that the longer they roll over, you know, the interest charges accumulate, or even if it's your own capital, the interest rate is like the opportunity cost, right? So if the interest rate's 5%, you know, I could invest my funds to, you know, give them to others and earn 5% a year. And so if I have a project that, you know, is only yielding 3%, I wouldn't, I wouldn't fund that. Whereas if the going market rate of interest for projects of comparable risk is only 1%, well, then my project that I could finance internally that is going to, you know, all told yield a return of 3% a year, that makes sense to do, right? So that's kind of the intuition. And that's also why when interest rates get artificially suppressed, that it stimulates the longer term projects, right? So things like housing, where that's a, you know, a very long lived good or skyscrapers, right? To build a skyscraper takes a lot of upfront funding. It takes a long time. And then once it's built, it's going to yield a flow of net income for a long time it's, it, versus like a hot dog vendor on the street, that kind of a project, that enterprise is not too sensitive to interest rates, right? If they push interest rates down, it's not like all of a sudden there's going to be a proliferation of street hot dog vendors, whereas they push interest rates down, like Mark is saying, you might now see new records in the height of, of new uh, skyscraper construction because that's the kind of area a business that's very sensitive to even small changes in interest rates. Okay, so that's kind of the intuition. And you see this like in recent years, for you guys, I don't know if you're being younger, it's, it's going to be as prevalent, but maybe you saw it like with, remember there were like all the NFTs with like guerrilla art and stuff like there's all these kind of goofy or just in general like crypto projects that were kind of, you know, a long shot. But hey, and the, and the idea is because there was a period when interest rates were rock bottom that investors who had capital, they couldn't, you know, park their money somewhere safe 
and earn anything. And so they, it's called like reaching for yield. So they would put it into riskier things because, hey, if I just you know keep it in treasuries or something that's relatively safe, I'm going to earn 1% or, or less. And so if I want to get a return on my money, and, and plus if, if price inflation is still there, like you're actually losing real purchasing power over time if you keep it. So you got to put it in something risky. And like Mark says, it's not that, I mean, the, you know, the NFTs and whatever, some of those were kind of goofy to outsiders, but in general, it's things like, oh, like artificial intelligence projects, right? So in Silicon Valley Bank, if you're familiar with that, when interest rates rose, they got hurt because it was a double whammy. So, you know, Silicon Valley Bank, a lot of their clients were, uh, you know, tech companies. And so they were doing things that is a kind of deal where, yeah, on paper, out of 10 such projects, nine of them probably aren't going to work out but that 10th one might be a home run. And so you might fund all 10 knowing that nine of these aren't going to work, but we're going to make such a high return on that one because, you know, it'll, it'll be the next Amazon or something like that. You, you don't know ahead of time. That's the, whole, that's the whole point. If it was obvious ahead of time, it already would have been funded and already would have been, you know, existing. It's, it's something in the future. And so when interest rates are very low, then those things get funded. And then when the, so when the Fed starts raising interest rates, all of a sudden the funding dries up. I was talking to somebody recently who was in the uh, biotech industry, and he was explaining how, yeah, once the Fed raised interest rates, like of the five major companies in his area in the city we were in, like four of them closed up shop because he said, yeah, they did just their management. They didn't know what they were doing. It was just they were awash in cheap money. And so, yeah, everyone was throwing money at, oh, yeah, pharmaceuticals and this stuff, and we're going to do all kinds of, you know, 3D printing of new lungs and all kinds of crazy stuff and whatever. And that was all funded when interest rates were low, but then once all of a sudden investors can just park their money in three month treasuries and earn 5%, all of a sudden this kind of dubious project when it's a bunch of 22 year olds in Silicon Valley or you know, have a new startup, that all of a sudden doesn't look like a very good investment. So that's kind of just some of the real world uh, implications of this stuff. Yeah, you, you far, far, yeah, pharmaceuticals and biotech is a very good example of all this because it's a project that's going to last 20 to 50 years, you know, you're, and it's going to take 15 to 20 years of development. So the company is going to have to invest 50 to $100 million per year in expenses for the scientists, the laboratories, and so forth, without any revenue coming about whatsoever. So the drug might or might not get approved 15 years from now, and it's only then that revenue starts accruing. So that revenue, 15 or 20 years or 25 or 30 years into the future, has to be discounted by the fact that the company is investing 50 or $100 million into that particular trial every year. Okay, so you could have put your money in the bank and earned interest. Instead, you put it into this company so we have to discount those future revenues far into the future uh, by all of the foregone interest in the present. So if the interest rate is very low, more people are going to be willing to invest in those extremely long run type projects. So in general, you know, the market economy is able to allocate goods across time to be very farsighted, right? So that's a typical complaint against the market is interventionists will often say, oh, yeah, we need the government to engage in like long term research and development funding, you know, things that are in the long haul because the market economy, you know, the shareholders just care about next quarter's re report. They, they, they don't they're not long term thing. And that that's not correct. In fact, it's the other way around. And certainly if you're talking about a democratic state, because there it's, you know, it's obvious that both theoretically and in, and in practice, just looking at what happens that the people running the state, you know, they're only in charge for a short period until the next election. And so they try to extract as much wealth, either literally or by giving favors to, you know, their private sector clients and then knowing, oh, yeah, once we're out of power, we're going to get a nice cushy job consulting or something. So, right. So it's, it's for, just to give you an example, if there's a national forest and they have logging contracts, it's, it's very typical that the, the government, and you certainly see it's like in, in cases like in South America where they have like, you know, they clear cut the forest and all the capitalism just ravages the land. No, those are examples where the government technically owns the forest and they give the logging rights to some private company that comes in and cuts it down 
because the people in charge, it's, to them, it's not like an asset that they own. It's just right now we're in charge of this. And so if we give a sweetheart deal to this company, then even when we're a power, they can kind of pay us the favor back somehow. And that's not corrupt. Whereas we, if we if we develop it, you know, whereas if you're a private owner and it was the, the private company actually owned the forest outright, they wouldn't just chop all the trees down and then not have anything left. I mean, that would be silly, just like a private you know, rancher doesn't all of a sudden slaughter all the animals and then, oh, we don't have any more animals anymore. Like that doesn't, that doesn't happen, right? So that's the fundamental difference between public and private ownership. So in, in, the, in general, how is it that the market economy allocates things over time in, in ways like, okay, we could consume more today versus down the fut- in the future. Like if there's a fixed stockpile of something, like let's say oil, right? That even, for, imagine all the oil on earth, every, which is a giant pool that was privately owned, and for, you know, forget about climate change and that stuff. Just in general, I think a lot of interventionist types would think, oh, the market's very short-sighted. They would just burn all that up you know, in the next couple of years and then and our future generations wouldn't have any left. But no, because there they would just look ahead and say, oh, wait, the market price of crude oil would be sky high five years from now if we burn too much of this now. And so that's what, you know, that, so they, they hold some off the market in anticipation of those future revenues. But to be able to do that properly, you need to know, what's a dollar 10 years from now worth compared to a dollar today? And that's what the interest rate tells you. And so, you know, the whole point with the Austrian theory of the business cycle is if that number is wrong, if it's artificially low, if it's lower than it's supposed to be, then the interest rate's not doing its job. It's not, it's not communicating the right information and guidance to the entrepreneur. So they need market prices, but the prices have to be the correct ones. Otherwise, it doesn't work as well. Um, do you maybe want to talk about, like a, you know, the, I know we've talked about this before, but just to give you a chance that, the common objection that, well, gee, if it's so obvious, I mean, doesn't the businessman know that the Fed's doing QE, and so if the interest rates are artificially low, why don't they just take that into account when they, you know, bid on factors? I think our audience wants to what wants to know what's going to happen next week, Bob. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, I mean th- th- that that happens all the time. Every cycle, uh, the people who are not good at predicting uh, get put out of business in terms of ec- economic forecasting, whether they're consulting forecasters or they're um, business entrepreneurs, the bad ones end up getting weeded out. And part of that process is if you say, well, no, I, I know all about the Austrian business cycle theory, and I know the Fed is artificially stimulating interest rates, so I'm not going to invest in stocks and I'm not going to uh, invest in you know a new plant and equipment and new products and so forth. Um, market competition will take you out. Um, whether you're a journalist on television, uh, whether you're a, a economic consultant, uh, whether you're a business owner, uh, a banker, um, anybody who who sort of uses foresight and just refuses to participate, well, I mean, there's people coming along all the time. And, you know, like, for example, New York Bank, um, uh, in New York City, the big banking sec, uh, center, careers there are typically only 10 to 20 years long. So it's basically you're only in there for one business cycle, uh, one full, large business cycle. So... You know, the, uh, the, the problem is, is that good entrepreneurs or informed entrepreneurs about the Austrian theory simply won't make it, and they'll be displaced by people who are willing to take a chance with the Fed's money. And, and so there's no learning over time um, on the part of the market uh, because of this dis- displacement effect and many other things as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, th- this is a bit simplistic, but if you just imagine that, you know, the Fed's cranking out $100 bills and showering it around, even if a lot of the people in the crowd, you know, like let's say the, the entrepreneurs know that, yeah, this is not going to end well, I'm going to I'm going to refrain from this. If there's some people stepping forward and say, yeah, I'll take those $100 bills, I'll go hire some workers, and it, it, I mean, they're going to bid up prices. So like Mark is saying, it's it's not enough, even if a few people understand at some level yeah, this, this is distortionary and, and the, all this money flooding in is, is messing things up. You kind of have to go along. You can't just you know, sit on the sidelines for 10 years while your competitors make uh, profits hand over fist. Okay, now in the final third, 
You, so Mark has a, a higher time preference than I do. I, he was like, oh, let's get into the fun stuff. We're now, I've, I've patiently waited, and now for the final third here, we'll talk about the current situation. Um, my quick view is, for a while, I've been looking what's called the inverted yield curve. I won't go through it here. I've done it on the Human Action Podcast a lot. For people, by the way, you, know, you folks here and then online, I'll put links in the show notes page to this episode uh, you know, to get further reading on this stuff. But I have done work, especially with um, Ryan Griggs, and I have a, a co-authored piece linking the well-known among all you know financial analysts, the empirical correlation of when the yield curve inverts, there's very soon after a recession, and that's been true since the 1960s in the U.S. at least. Right now, we are in the midst of the longest, deepest such inversion, at least since World War II. And so for a while, you know, I've been saying this is flashing warning signs, but the reason, you know, the crash hasn't happened yet is because it just stayed inverted, right? Like the Fed has kept rates up. So normally by this point, you know, I guess what would have happened is they would have seen the crash coming. They would have cut rates and then, you know, the crash would have happened that they saw coming. It's not that the cutting rates causes the crash, but that's, so that's what's a little bit weird right now in terms of the timing. But like I say, as of yesterday, there was the markets freaking out, a lot of new bad data coming in in terms of employment and whatnot. And so it looks like, okay, maybe this still is the same thing. But I will stop there with my views. What, what do you think in terms of the current climate? Well, I'll plug my own podcast, the Minor Issues podcast, because I've been at least mentioning the inverted yield curve. And, uh, and a lot of my thoughts are based on your work um, and Paul Swick's work um, on the inverted yield curve. And when the yield curve inverted, uh, when short-term rates rose above long-term rates back in 2022, there was a tremendous amount of discussion in the financial press and in the media and amongst economists about that inversion of the yield curve causing a recession. But either on the basis of Austrian analysis or just based on the, on the evidence itself, the, the fact that the yield curve inverts at some point in time does not mean that the recession is going to come full-blown right at that very moment. And so the trick is, if you want to time the recession, is to figure out, well, how much time has to pass between the inversion and the onset of an official recession? And, you know, empirically and from Austrian analysis, there's a, a period of time that takes place where the inversion and in yield curves actually has to work through things like production plans, financial structures, accounting books, and so forth, before businesses start to uh, melt down or implode. And my own guesstimate, uh, back in 2022 was that the recession probably wasn't going to emerge, officially at least, until the inversion went away. Right now, we're at a point in time where the inversion is disappearing and strong signs of a recession are appearing. Okay, so we're not in a official recession at this point, but the unemployment numbers are all looking worse than they used to, certainly than they did a year ago or two years ago. And, and so the recession indicators uh, are certainly going in that direction. The unemployment rate is up. Job openings are down, full-time employment is down, um, uh, uh, part-time jobs are up, but uh, temporary jobs uh, openings are down. So the leading edges uh, that indicate a recon an economy slipping into a recession are certainly starting to appear, and interest rates that have been where short-term interest rates have been above long-term interest rates, that's starting to change. And of course, the Fed is on the cusp of cutting interest rates so that those short-term rates uh, will soon come down. And of course, 
A lot of people have been complaining, a lot of big names people have been complaining that the Fed should have already cut interest rates, that the economy is slipping into a recession. The Fed held firm this past week, did not cut rates, more or less promised that they would cut rates in two months. Um, and we kind of expect, or I kind of expect, that the, the signs of a recession and a weak stock market, that kind of thing, should be readily apparent uh, between now and the September meeting. And um, I guess the biggest sign would be if they had some kind of an emergency meeting and cut the rates mm -hmm. um, in between the meetings of the uh, Central Planning Bureau of the Fed. Yeah, let me just, especially since we're here at Mises U, let me just make sure you guys aren't misunderstanding because a lot of times the way like a conventional Keynesian type analyst will talk about this stuff is they'll, they'll say things along the lines of like, oh yeah, the Fed kept rates too high, they should have cut, they were too worried about you know, price inflation, they wanted to be hawks and show they were, they were strong, holding the line on inflation, but they should have been more concerned about unemployment. And they lead you to believe that, oh, if only the Fed had cut a few months ago, then we wouldn't have had a recession, right? Like, so that's exactly how the standard Keynesian, like, you know, like a Dean Baker or Paul Krugman and people like that talk. In the Austrian view, it's not that the Fed hiking rates is causing the recession. It's that the artificially low rates during the so-called good period, the boom, is where the, the seeds of, the, of the, you know, the crash were sown. So from the Austrian point of view, it's that there was malinvestments during the, the boom is creating an unsustainable feeling of prosperity. And then a crash is inevitable. And yes, the particular timing of the crash depends on when the banking system led by the central bank Titans and, and you know hikes rates and whatever, but it's not that if they just kept late rates low forever, we would never have the, never have a crash. No, because it's it's the Austrian thing. It's not merely monetary. There's real resources being incorrectly invested in the wrong projects or tied up in projects that in and of themselves they're okay, but it's just they're too long given consumer preferences at the moment, and that's the problem, right? So there's just like an internal mismatch. The production structure, in a sense, is unsustainable. So you don't, you can't undo that just by keeping rates low or pumping in more money. That's not going to fix it. All that will do is, you know, perpetuate the mail investment and then make the subsequent crash that much worse. Okay, so just make sure, you know, you, you understand that, that even though it's true what might tip it one way or the other is a particular Fed move, that's not why a crash is, go, is going to happen. Um, maybe one last thing, and are, are you able to field questions? Okay, yeah, so why don't we, we'll, we'll save some time here at the end. Let me just make one more comment in general. I don't want you to walk away thinking like, oh, the Austrians are very good like qualitatively, but you know, in com when it comes to empirical predictions, the Keynesians have the upper hand because that's their area. No, the, the Keynes, just to give you two quick examples of how wrong the Keynesians were, that going, right when Obama got elected, it was this famous uh, Christina Romer, Jared Bernstein, the same Bernstein that was in the MMT presentation, if you saw the one, that was like, oh yeah, they 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 lend money and then they, and then this power move with the coffee. That same guy was. They were saying that oh yes, the incoming Obama you know stimulus package. If we do nothing, this this recession that had begun under you know the evil Republican, the unemployment rate is going to get up to a certain amount. If we do the re, the stimulus package, it will keep the unemployment rate below that. They went ahead and did the stimulus package, and the unemployment rate went above what they were warning would happen if we do nothing. Okay, so on that end, you know, it was like, what more could happen to show? And their excuse was, wow, it's a good thing we passed the stimulus because otherwise you, we, the economy was worse than we realized. That was the way they handled it, right? And then the, op the mirror image happened later with the so-called sequester when the Republicans really dug in their heels and they got some spending cuts. And the Keynesians were warning, if this sequester goes in, you know, GDP growth is going to be this low amount. If we don't do the sequester, GDP growth will be higher, because, you know, they think deficit spending boosts the economy. The Republicans did get their sequester, and GDP growth was higher than what the Keynesians said would happen if we don't do the sequester. So, again, it was the mirror image, and I'm saying that happens all the time. There's plenty of historical examples where a government in a, in a, in a tough economy cut spending, and then everything was fine. And to my knowledge, there's no examples of when a government, you know, there was a bad economy, and then they deficit spent, and the economy improved. There's like no example. Even in World War II, you might think, no, like um, when they do, when Robert Barrow did like the multiplier analysis, 
it was very, it wasn't a good example, right? Like more, Robert Higgs has done work on this. Like they drafted more men to go into World War I. Unemployment went down by fewer men than they literally sucked out to go ship overseas, okay? So there, there's no good example of it ever working. It's always, they say, it would have been even worse had we not done that. They're always pointing to how bad it would have been, okay? Yeah, the second half of my skyscraper book is actually comparing what the Austrians say versus the Keynesians and mainstream economists over a period of 100 years. I mean, you could write a whole book on the Fed's incorrect predictions over the last three years. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so why don't we hurry up and maybe we'll try to get two questions I think we got time for. Uh, thank you for the podcast. Should we go along with the flow of the business cycle as entrepreneurs, business owners, or just uh, consumers in, in general? So, yeah, the question is, should we, like, fight the Fed or should we just go with the flow and, and ride the wave? Well, I think we need to fight the Fed, certainly academically, ideologically, scientifically, politically, in every way possible. Uh, but I think you need to be weary of the Fed and what it can do and what it has done and the disruptive capability Uh, of the Fed, what it can create in people's daily lives. I mean, the Fed is ruining people's lives all the time. People are experiencing unemployment this past week uh, because of the business cycle that the Fed caused and the male investments that it caused. And, and you know, the, the same thing in commercial real estate for business people, So, yes, I mean, you, have to, you, you can't win against the Fed. It's too powerful, so you have to be leery about it. Yeah, and I would encourage people just to, if you're like, for investment advice, follow people who, they're not purely ideological, right? Like, yeah, it's good if they had the same worldview as you do in terms of cause and effect, but try to find people who you can just tell, like, they're really trying to, you know, guide you honestly and not just doing, like, what my team is saying on this issue. So, um, well, Austrian economics explains the business cycle really well. Um, but as you were talking today, it's impossible to say exactly when, you know, the boom or bust is going to occur. So my question is, um, how can we really use our understanding of the phases of the business cycle practically? Okay, so how do we use our understanding of the business cycle in practice? Well, I mean, I think you can see... Uh, abnormalities in the economy. I think you can see the abnormalities, for example, right now in the real estate market, the impact of interest rates on mortgage rates, and then those interest rates and how it squeezed the current real estate market in housing, you know, and driving prices sky high, while simultaneously seeing abnormal weak sectors in the economy, such as commercial real estate, that was caused by interest rate policy of a longer term nature, that that's a longer term problem that people were investing in over a period of a decade or more. So I think that the, the Austrian theory of the business cycle can at least alert you to the fact of abnormalities in marketplaces with regarding just general unemployment and employment conditions, uh, realist, general real estate conditions, so that you don't make the worst possible uh, mistakes, like um, you know investing at the top of a stock market. Uh, there are more traditional ways of doing things, um, you know, in terms of investing in stocks, buying real estate, um, and so on. So. Uh, use it to look for the abnormalities in order to try to avoid things. You don't want to be a perma bear. Um, you know, the, the, the capitalist world is getting better over time. Uh, standards of living are still rising. So you don't want to crawl into a hole and uh, hope things go past. Uh, you have to participate in life. But the, uh, the Austrian theory of the business cycle can make you alert to those uh, abnormalities which you want to avoid. 
And, and we're up on time here. The last thing I'll mention on that is I'll, I'll plug Mark Spitznagel. I, I was a, a consultant on his recent book on, on safe haven investing. And so there, you know, not saying you'll go pick his fund, but he just lays out principles. For example, you could be long the stock market, but, but be very tail hedged. Like, so you buy a bunch of put options so that in case the market goes down 20%, then you make a boatload of money. So like on the upswing, you don't quite match the performance, but you have a lot of heavy protection on the downside. So there's things like that where Mark's saying you're not just completely on the sidelines, but yet you have a lot of protection in place. Okay, uh, thanks everybody. And we're going to have the music in. All right. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.